I'm Dave Webb, I'm Chair of Yorkshire CND, and we have some very fantastically interesting speakers tonight uh, to talk about the end of the possible end of the, of the nuclear age. Um, if you haven't been on one of these sessions before, if you move your cursor to the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little box called Q&A, and there you can enter any questions you might have. The first half of the of this session will be the speakers uh, presenting, uh, and then the second half will be addressing your questions that you put forward. So um, please just enter those as, as we go along. Uh, also, we're, we're going to do a poll to so that we can find out and the speakers can find out more or less where you're coming from when you uh, visit us. So it's just asking a few very simple questions. Uh, if you could just fill that in in the next couple of minutes, that would be very useful for all of us, I think. Okay, we'll leave that on for a little while. <clears throat> In the meantime, I'll just give a, a general introduction. Uh, this month, we mark the 75th anniversary of the dawn of the nuclear age, but uh, international action may finally be calling for an end to the nuclear threat. Uh, the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW, it opened for signatories in September 2017 and once 50 countries have ratified it, it will enter into force and become part of international law. Currently, 82 states, uh, Sudan actually signed today, those states have signed, um, but only 40 so far have ratified. It's a much longer process to ratify through the various government processes. So we only need, in fact, 10 more ratifications in order to bring the, um, the treaty into force. The UK government, unfortunately, has repeatedly said that it will not sign the treaty, but it will be able to, well, but what, well, the question is, will it be able to resist this important arms controls initiative uh, and the international support it has and continue to squander billions of pounds on new weapons of mass destruction, especially as we're now emerging from the current international crisis, which could see the economy facing its worst recession for 300 years. Can Britain really afford costly and dangerous projects like this Trident nuclear weapon system and its 205 billion replacement currently under development? We do have an opportunity to reevaluate, however, to build back better via initiatives such as the Green New Deal or the Defence Diversification Agency. And we have two speakers tonight very well qualified to speak on this issue. First, we have Alicia Sanders Zakra, who is the policy and research coordinator at the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICAN, who started the treaty in the first place and got, saw, saw it through to fruition. Alithia directs and coordinates research on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons and general nuclear weapons policy. Previous to this post, with ICANN, she was a researcher at the Arms Control Association at the, and at the Brookings Institution. She's published over 100 news articles, editorials and reports on nuclear weapons, and has also provided expert analysis for several newspapers and radio programs. Then after she has spoken, we have Fabian Hamilton MP, who's probably very well known to many on, on this call. Fabian has been MP for Leeds Northeast since 1997 and a good friend to CND. He is said to be the first MP to hold a virtual surgery for, con for his constituents who can go to his constituency office while he's in London and converse via the webcam. So he's used to this kind of format, I think. Fabian has been a member of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee since 2001 and he's also a chairman of the All Party Group 
on business services, prison health, or the groups that is, prison health and civil contingency. He also serves the, as the vice chairman of the All Party Iran group and chairs the All Party Parliamentary Group for Tibet. I'm sure you'll correct me if I've got any of that wrong. On the 7th of January 2016, Fabian was appointed a shadow foreign minister outside the shadow cabinet. And in 2016, he was appointed by Jeremy Corbyn as shadow minister for peace and disarmament. The first time this role had been held. And when the uh, new elected leader of the Labour Party, Sir Keir Starmer, uh, was elected uh, as leader, he kept the post and with Fabian continuing in the role. So that's what we have in store, those brilliantly um, qualified speakers. And first we'll start with Alithia. So thanks Alithia for turning up. Thanks to both of you for turning up, but uh, over to you Alithia to start. Great, uh, thank you so much for having me and for the very kind introduction. I'm just gonna share my screen. I've prepared a few slides. Uh, great, so yeah, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here with you uh, virtually to talk about um, ICANN's work on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and give a bit of an update on where things stand with the treaty um, and, uh, you know, our plans for the upcoming uh, anniversaries of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki this August. So most of you are familiar with ICANN as uh, ICANN partners, but just in case a few of you are not, uh, we're a coalition of over 500 partner organizations in over 100 countries uh, with our headquarters in Geneva, where I'm based, uh, with the goal to ban, stigmatize, and eliminate nuclear weapons. And uh, we were just awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017 for our work on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And now we work to promote uh, adherence to and implementation of that treaty as it nears entry into force. And again, this might be a refresher for many of you, but for those of you who are not aware, um, just a little bit of information about the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, it bans essentially all uh, activities related to nuclear weapons, including development, testing, producing, manufacturing, transferring, possessing, stockpiling, using or threatening to use, um, or allowing nuclear weapons to be stationed uh, on a country's territory, um, as well as assisting or encouraging or inducing um, any other country uh, to, uh, to carry out these activities. And in, in addition to these prohibitions, there are um, some really impressive positive obligations to redress some of the harms of nuclear weapons use and testing uh, by obligating uh, victim assistance and environmental remediation for uh, people and places that have been harmed by nuclear weapons use and testing. Um, so just again, a little more information about the treaty. Um, this graphic is from the 2019 Nuclear Weapons Ban Monitor, um, which is um, a annual report put together by another ICANN partner organization, the Norwegian People's Aid, um, that looks at the current status of the treaty and uh, implementation of the treaty. So it also provides just some background information that can be really useful um, to get some more details about the treaty. Um, so within the treaty, there are certain provisions as well about um, the verification of nuclear disarmament and uh, standards for safeguarding of nuclear material in accordance with international standards. Um, and this chart kind of gives you a bit of information about um, the differences and similarities between the, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, kind of the existing uh, cornerstone, as it's called, of the uh, nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime, and uh, this additional uh, legal instrument, the, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, and happy to, to answer any additional questions uh, from any more newcomers about these details, but just thought it might be interesting to lay them out the offset. 
So um, where do we stand currently with the treaty? As was mentioned, there are currently 82 signatory states and 40 states that have ratified or acceded to the treaty. Um, and some of these several of these ratifications have come while we're uh, under the coronavirus lockdown. And as was mentioned, Sudan just, jo just joined the treaty as a signatory state um, under these conditions, which I think really speaks to the commitment of many of these countries to pursue nuclear disarmament, even under the most challenging conditions. Um, there is quite a, a geographical breakdown in which countries have supported and joined the treaty. So the majority of the support has come from Africa and, and the Americans and the Caribbean. Um, but there has been some, albeit limited, support from uh, European countries, including, of course, Ireland and Austria, who were part of the kind of core group of countries pushing the treaty forward. And this graph also comes from the uh, Nuclear Weapons Ban Monitor, which is available online if you want to see more information. Um, but another interesting breakdown to kind of examine uh, where the treaty stands is to not only look at which countries have formally signed and ratified it, but which countries would actually be compliant with the core prohibitions of the treaty um, if they were to adhere to it. And we've seen that the vast majority of the world uh, is compliant with the core prohibitions, uh, given the, the legal analysis by, by the ban monitor. Um, so I think it just speaks to kind of the overarching global norm for nuclear disarmament uh, that the treaty represents and um, the fact that a lot of times the hurdle to get more countries to, to join the treaty is, is more of a bureaucratic problem than, um, than a lot of political resistance, although it depends, of course, on the country. This is another just kind of, I think, interesting uh, statistic to look at. Um, just to note that the, the ban monitor, as I mentioned, was released in, in 2019. So that's, it was October 2019. So um, this graph will have changed a little bit and I'm looking forward to kind of see, seeing the next iteration uh, in October. But um, we can see that actually the, the TPNW has an adherence rate that is comparable to other similar international treaties. Um, and I think that's particularly remarkable given uh, the intense pressure that a number of countries have faced from the nuclear armed states not to join the treaty, um, as well as you know, the fact that we're currently operating, of course, under uh, a global pandemic. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're still seeing countries join the treaty. Um, so just you know, something to, to think about, something that we're certainly thinking about as we see the, the treaty uh, progress and more countries join it after you know, we see activism from many of our different partner organizations pushing their, their country to join um, is kind of what happens next after entering the force. And uh, within the text of the treaty, um, it says that the, the after um, the treaty will enter into force 90 days after uh, 50 countries have ratified or acceded to it. And then within one year of that entry into force will be the first meeting of states parties, um, which will be a really, um, I think, interesting uh, and important gathering of states to kind of hammer out some of the details uh, in the text that were left up to this meeting, uh, as well as to discuss, um, you know, beyond what's in this civil society um, document, the ban monitor about compliance to kind of have a, an actual states parties um, uh, chance to discuss um, how they see the, the terms being interpreted and, and their, the country's compliance. Um, so that's something that, you know, we're also kind of preparing for as we work towards entering the force. Um, we're also kind of preparing for this big meeting. Um, and another component to that is that within the treaty, it's also allowed uh, for countries to participate as observer states to the first meeting of states parties. Um, and there are a number of countries, uh, Switzerland is one example, uh, which you know we're still pressuring them, of course, to join the treaty but they've also said that they will participate as an observer uh, to the first meeting of states parties. So it's another kind of interesting 
marker to see which countries decide to participate in the process as observers. Um, so, you know, I think it's just important to, to reflect on as we work on promoting this treaty and getting into entering into force, just the, the conditions that we're operating under. Um, and as I've mentioned, we've still seen some success, which is really exciting. Um, and on another level, it's just um, also really, um, I think, an opportunity to think about uh, the opportunity costs when we see the the serious scarcity um, and lacking of resources for critical um, critical services for the people in terms of health uh, and and other services to deal with this you know unprecedented uh, crisis um, to see that that money is in, is going towards nuclear weapons and being wasted towards nuclear weapons uh, it's an opportunity I think for us to to point that out and and show that. You know, nuclear weapons are always an op opportunity cost, but particularly now uh, we see just what a waste it is to be spending billions of dollars each year on weapons that are designed to take away lives when we need to be investing in the supplies to save lives. Um, so ICANN has produced, I produced some, some calculations about uh, annual spending um, for all of the nuclear arms states and then did some projections on what that could buy instead. Um, so this is one example for the UK. Uh, and on our website is also um, the full report with all of the nuclear arms states and the estimated uh, expenses for nuclear weapons they spent in 2019. And happy to answer more questions about that. Um, so, you know, of course, while we're really working for um, the entry into force of this treaty. We're also taking some time this summer uh, to remember the uh, tragic catastrophic uh, bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, and the anniversaries coming up this August. Um, I'm sure many of you are, are already familiar with these statistics, but for those uh, who are not familiar with the details, um, you know, this is just, um, such a, a powerful and tragic moment um, that we want to commemorate with the survivors um, and take time to, to educate ourselves further uh, about the events and educate others uh, and spread, spread the message of the survivors. Um, so on that note, this summer, we're, we're doing a lot of work with uh, the Hibakusha, with the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to be able to, to spread their testimony and to encourage um, people to not only learn about their stories, uh, but also to honor them with action. Um, and there's a, a new website um, that, you know, you can see the link here. Um, and, you know, we're encouraging our, our campaigners uh, to share this, this website and this information in the pledge with friends uh, to participate in upcoming events and of course, to, to continue to take action to promote, to promote uh, the entry into force of the TPNW, uh, including through the city's appeal, uh, which I think will be addressed uh, by someone else later in this webinar, uh, but happy to also answer more questions about that. Um, just uh, one thing to, to note is that uh, an upcoming event, there's one event that will be late uh, this evening, but you can also watch it later for the next 24 hours, uh, which is a tour, um, a, a virtual tour on Instagram Live uh, of the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum, which is really a once in a lifetime opportunity to get to see this museum, uh, to have a guided tour from wherever you are and um, to, to educate yourself and to educate others um, so I encourage you to, to check that out. It's on our Instagram account, uh, which is at nuclear ban. Um, and I think it, it'll be about 1 a.m. Um, our time, or at least 1 a.m. in Geneva, but again, available for the next 24 hours. Uh, so you can check that out at your leisure. Um, so that's, um, that's the presentation, um, just kind of some information about the TPNW and upcoming events. And I'm happy to, to answer questions in the in the Q&A.
Thank you very much, Lydia. That's uh, wonderful. I think we'll keep the questions till the end uh, after Fabian's talk, because Jackie Burke from Greater Manchester CND will be coordinating that. Um, so that's after Fabian. So Fabian, thank you very much for turning up too. And uh, please, over to you. You have to turn your microphone on though. You try. There we are. Thank you very much, Dave, and thank you uh, for inviting me today, and thank you everybody for uh, listening in to this event. It's a, it's a first, I think, uh, certainly for CND since I've been involved. Um, I need to correct you on, on one or two uh, intro uh, things, and that is that um, uh, I, I no longer chair all those, uh, those parliamentary groups because when you're appointed to the front bench, you're not allowed to, uh, to chair parliamentary groups anymore. But the more important ones I was involved in were were Turkey uh, and uh, well Iceland as well of course which is a very progressive nation uh, but you've got to give all those up. Um, thank you for that. Uh, it doesn't seem like 23 plus years since I was elected in 97 and it certainly doesn't seem like nearly four years since we created or Jeremy Corbyn created the position of Shadow Minister for Peace and Disarmament, a role which initially put me into the defence team as well although uh, that thank goodness uh, I uh, was taken off back in April when uh, Keir Starmer reappointed me to this particular position. The other thing that might be worth noting is that in the previous Foreign Office team, I was covering the Middle East and North Africa. As you, many people watching this and listening will be aware, that is an area of the world that's endlessly fascinating, but unfortunately it's, it's all consuming. And I suspect that meant I didn't put the amount of effort that I wanted to put in to peace and disarmament to denuclearization, to uh, the NPT and all the other disarmament treaties that I should have done. Uh, now, that is all I have to do with a few uh, uh, country roles on top of that, but nothing like the Middle East. So Dave, uh, to win at the next general election, I think the Labour Party must make peace a priority for its foreign policy. And to do this, we need to make the case for conflict resolution and diplomacy over escalatory rhetoric and brinkmanship. As we all know, every day it becomes more and more clear that we can't go back to business as usual after this crisis where conflicts are allowed to claim the lives of innocent civilians across the world and the proliferation of nuclear and non-nuclear weapons rages on. But peace building and the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons cannot be allowed to fall by the wayside as the world battles coronavirus. I believe that there's never been a more appropriate time for countries to come together in the interests of global peace and stability than right now. And of course, Britain is in a prime position to lead on this. With our position on the UN Security Council, on the G7, and our fantastic institutions like the British Council, the BBC World Service, we're in dire need of the political will to take non-proliferation and conflict resolution forward. Now, while the calls from the UN Secretary General for a global ceasefire are very welcome indeed, we know it isn't going to last forever and it isn't really it isn't really that realistic so i think we've got to use this time to plan for our work together for the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons in the future and it's up to all of us campaigners like everybody listening today and politicians like me to now seize the agenda in the interests of humanitarianism international stability and peace Labour has always been the party of democracy and diplomacy, knowing that we have a responsibility to make the world a safer place, but also having a firmness with those who flout international law and attempt to build up their nuclear or uranium and plutonium stockpiles. With such an unstable and volatile situation the world finds itself in, and I believe will find itself in following the coronavirus crisis, the new Cold War that looks to be emerging between the United States and China needs ideas of the same caliber that brought about detente and the limited nuclear disarmament of the 1980s. In recent months, we've seen reports that China conducted an underground nuclear test and the US has discussed conducting their first nuclear tests underground since 1998. Alongside the ongoing issues in Hong Kong, disputes over the origins of coronavirus, the trade war, and Huawei, this has the real potential, I think, to become a hot war, one in which nuclear weapons would play a centrally destructive role. 
Now, any nuclear test has the potential to undo much of the progress that we've seen on arms control over the last 60 years. But as a nuclear arms state and a member of the UN Security Council, Britain, I believe, has a responsibility to prevent both our closest ally in the US resorting to nuclear brinkmanship, but also to be firm with Beijing. I'm afraid the British government simply, the current British government simply is not doing enough to either rein in President Trump or President Xi on these issues. So we have to make it clear that nuclear tests conducted by any nation would be a disaster for international peace and stability. Any suggestion that this talk of nuclear tests would force China and Russia into a new arms control treaty, as the US are attempting to do with START, is, I believe, a complete fallacy. Now, we need to look at how we can work with the international community to ensure, at the very least, that countries adhere to their commitments under international law. Specifically, of course, as has already been mentioned, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT. I therefore believe that we must start by working to complete the treaties that the UK has already ratified, much as I'd like to uh, see the UK ratify the uh, treaty for, the, for the, um, the TPNW. A good place, of course, to start would be the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which was ratified by the last Labour government and, of course, the French government, but was never ratified by China and the United States. Through our role on the UN and with our strong bilateral diplomatic relationship with the US, the UK can play a role in solidifying our historic treaty in the interests of world peace. That would certainly be a huge achievement and permanently remove the threat of nuclear brinkmanship. Another example of treaties that remain incomplete would be the NPT, of course, which celebrated its 50th anniversary earlier this year. And I was due to be there in New York with, I guess, some of the people who are, who are listening this evening. The NPT is certainly the most important multilateral nuclear treaty in history, but there are still some major non-signatories which the UK could play a part in bringing on board. The most notable, of course, are India and Pakistan. And with the Kashmir dispute intensifying, this has a real potential to spiral into a nuclear conflict and so gives the NPT an even bigger role to play. Now, the dispute over Kashmir and Jammu is extremely volatile, and I wouldn't be surprised to see if, um, in turn, if nuclear and, uh, due to India and Pakistan's absence from the NPT, the international community wouldn't have the chance of preventing it and the millions of lives that would certainly be lost. It would be catastrophic. The opportunity to bring non-signatories into the NPT will be at the review conference which was meant to be held, of course, this year, but was sadly postponed due to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. But it will take place next year. And as I've said, I plan to attend and make the case for the NPT to our international partners on behalf of the Labour Party and, I believe, on behalf of the UK, as the government, the British government, consistently fails to send representatives to these important conferences. Now, I've also had recent discussions with the Austrian, the New Zealand and the Canadian disarmament missions who are excellent examples of how to rally support with international partners for the expansion of these treaties. And I'm already working with them to develop this relationship from a British perspective. So if Labour do win the next general election and find themselves in government, we are ready to go from the very start. In the same vein, we also must look to work with the United States to prevent their withdrawal from open skies in six months. And of course, to work with them on start which expires in February 21, 2021. We have to be realistic in that we need American leadership for these treaties to become effective, and we shouldn't shy away from working with them on this. We must also make it clear that bringing China into the START negotiations is highly unlikely unless the United States massively reduces its stockpile of nuclear weapons. We also have issues with our Asian allies and partners who've recently warned that they mustn't be put in a position where they're forced to choose between China and the US. Any reversion back to the spheres of influence we saw between East and West and Europe for decades following the Second World War would be a disaster for peace and the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. The Prime Minister of Singapore has issued a direct plea for the status quo. Because of this, I also fear that any US military withdrawal from Asia would leave South Korea and Japan exposed to China, forcing their hand in acquiring nuclear weapons, 
which would certainly aggravate tensions on the Korean Peninsula. The problem is with President Trump in office at the moment, it's very hard to predict anything that the United States may or may not do. Beijing perceives multilateral agreements negotiated by a few powerful nations, including bilateral agreements such as the New START negotiations, as hegemonic. Since the beginning of the nuclear arms race, China has opposed allowing decisions about nuclear weapons to be made without the participation of non-nuclear weapon states, and has criticized them as an attempt to consolidate nuclear monopoly, mainly on the part of the US, and they do have a point, don't they? So in order to encourage China to sign up to these important treaties, we must look to strike a balance between non-proliferation and inclusivity, not allowing the world to be forced into a precarious agreement where more nuclear weapons are seen to, are seen to provide world security through the dangerous precedent of mutually assured destruction. Beijing has a tendency to view international agreements negotiated by the United Nations as more inclusive and equitable. And the evidence shows that their outcomes are far more stable. Therefore, internationalism is a huge part of this process. For example, China had a hand in writing the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and encouraged the then leadership to go further to help negotiate the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty, which banned the production of uranium and plutonium for use in making nuclear warheads. Pakistan remains a stumbling block to this coming into force. So again, we must work to ensure that they sign any new agreement too and impress on China that a, an agreement that they helped to forge should be one that they finally do ratify. That's the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. We must make, I think, what is both the moral and indeed, if I can use the word, the patriotic case for ending the proliferation of nuclear weapons across the world. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, opinions on what we spend our money on are changing. And Alicia in illustrated that so well with a renewed focus on health and public infrastructure and education rather than nuclear weapons. And it's an obscenity in my mind, and I did vote against this, that we are thinking at this time that we're actually implementing as a country, the renewal of the Trident nuclear weapons system. It is disgraceful. This is therefore an unprecedented opportunity for Britain to take an active role in world affairs, which is more important as we withdraw from the European Union and to be a real force for positive change across the world. Our diplomatic core is second to none, and we must utilize this historic power to begin a new nuclear non-proliferation agenda with the greatest urgency. Now, while I recognize these ideas will be challenged by the Conservatives as being unpatriotic and putting our country at risk of attack, we must be clear that this will do the exact opposite. It will only make us safer. So that's why, as the government continues to fail to send a representative to observe or take part in the negotiations of the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, Labour must be there to fly the flag for Britain and to let the world know that we're serious about nuclear disarmament. While leading the way, we must take our international allies and partners with us. My friends, as we approach the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the start of August, August this serves as a timely reminder of what is really at stake here. I'd be happy to take any questions you have on the future of non nuclear non-proliferation in the Labour Party. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabian. <clears throat> Thank you both for uh, some excellent uh, comments there. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Jackie Burke, who will handle the question and answer. So in case you haven't seen it already, participants, there are some questions coming in, but uh, there's a box at the bottom of the screen called Q&A. If you click on that, you'll be able to put your question. So Jackie, over to you. Thank you, Dave, um, and thank you very much um, to our speakers. Um, the first question that's come in is for Alicia, and it's from Sean, and it's from Sean Morris. Um, Sean asks, as someone who is heavily involved in encouraging towns and cities to support the ICANN Cities Appeal through the Nuclear Free Local Authorities and Mayors for Peace, um, how does ICANN use this powerful list of cities in its lobbying with states? What more can councils do? Uh, well, first, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your work on the city's appeal. Um, it's a really powerful tool that we've seen uh, is really one way to engage um, at different levels, uh, citizens and local governments, 
um, on these issues, even when they have a federal government that has kind of staked out its position against uh, the TPNW. Um, and the, you know, the city's appeal kind of came about in recognition that cities are often the targets of nuclear weapons. And so they should have a say on uh, whether their country continues to, to have these weapons of mass destruction. Um, so, you know, part of the idea is to recognize the agency uh, of all people in every country on these issues and of uh, government at all levels um, to, to feel like they should be able to, to speak up on foreign policy. Um, I think it's, it's also turned out just to be, you know, as I said, an enormously useful tool to be able to point to the public support uh, within these countries, even when you have the political elite uh, saying that, you know, these weapons keep us safe. Time and time again, in countries around the world, we can point to capitals and uh, major cities and towns across the country that will speak up and say, these weapons don't keep us safe, you know, not at all. Um, one example uh, has just been recently in the past few months in Germany, there's been a major debate uh, sparked by, you know, the leader of um, the Social Democratic Party there against nuclear weapons, where, you know, this parliament parliamentarian expressly spoke out about saying that uh, he didn't think that nuclear weapons keep Germany safe, quite the opposite. And, you know, in response to that, you had, you know, Jan Stoltenberg writing an op-ed about how important it is to keep, how safe nuclear weapons keep Germany. And so having that local resistance, I think is so powerful and something that we really lift up. Uh, and it's a, another way to unite uh, people from, you know, across Europe, where you have these populations that are very supportive of disarmament, and then, you know, some political leaders that are not. So, you know, I, I really can't um, speak up about how, you know, useful it is for people to be encouraging their local governments to join the city's appeal. We have a whole website dedicated to that, where you can see other cities that have joined, um, and, you know, what a great tool it is. So thanks for that question. Um, thank you. We've got another one for you, Alicia. While we've got while we've got you on the on the screen, uh, Sanjay Joshi has asked in the pie chart that you showed of the different European nations, would it be fair to say that the most valuable areas for pressing for activism is in the undecided countries, for instance, um, in Switzerland? Well, you know, I think I wouldn't say that there's, you know, one more valuable place than another, as, you know, I think the city's appeal demonstrates everybody in every country uh, has a say and can participate in the movement in, in a different way. Um, I think within some countries, there's a bit more uh, appetite for different types of action. So Switzerland's a great example. Um, there's been a lot of legislative action against the federal government's uh, decision to, to not join the treaty, uh, where you actually had a parliamentary motion adopted uh, saying that the federal government, government does have to join the treaty. Uh, and that prompted a reconsideration of the federal government's decision uh, to have to reevaluate its position sooner than it was planning to. Um, so, you know, within some countries where there you know, it really, it depends, every country is different. And this is why it's so great to have uh, such a coalition of different organizations in different countries. And being based in Geneva, I just try to support the work of our local campaigners uh, with resources and uh, publications. But, you know, I think the, the campaigners on the ground really know the best strategy in their own country uh, and can talk to, to other campaigners that are dealing with similar situations in different countries. So I think, you know, it's important for, for all campaigners to be pushing um, to join the treaty. And it's just, it's a different tactic depending on the local situation. Um, so we now have a question for Fabian. Um, give Alicia time to have a, have a drink of water. Um, Fabian, this question's from Catherine Ban, Kath Ban. Um, she wants to know, do you know whether the new Labour leadership would be supported, supportive of the TPNW, or is there a view that the NPP is the better vehicle for, for disarmament? 
Well, I, I think the answer is, is has been fairly clear that uh, both the previous leadership, in spite of Jeremy Corbyn's own uh, personal opinion, and the new leadership um, and previous leaderships of the Labour Party have been strong in favour of the non-proliferation treaty uh, and have not been in favour of the TPNW. But um, I, I think we need to discuss this. I think this is something that we need to talk about uh, in the Labour leadership um, because the world is changing. It's changing very fast. And I think Alicia's very welcome slide at the beginning in her introduction showed that what you can buy for the money that uh, we're, we're talking about spending. Well, all the plans and all the budgets for weapons and for um, uh, different departments of state have gone out the window, haven't they, in the United Kingdom? And this is the time now, I think, where we could really make an impact by discussing not only why nuclear weapons do not make us or any other country safer, but how, together with those states, those 122 countries, and I was, I think, the only parliamentarian present in New York uh, for the first session of the negotiations on the TPNW. Um, the British government didn't even bother to send the most junior of diplomats. So I think the, the answer is not as clear as you might think. Um, there's no doubt the current leadership is more so-called establishment than the previous uh, leadership. However, I think the current leadership is perhaps more likely to examine very carefully uh, what we, how we could enter into the TPNW with other states, um, how we would obviously be the first nuclear armed state to do so, but how also in the run up to that, we need to make sure the non-proliferation treaty is further signed, sealed and delivered uh, on its 50th anniversary or 51st anniversary review next year. Okay. Sorry, struggling to unmute myself. <laughs> um, on, on the back of that, Fabian, um, Sanjay Joshi asked another question um, and he said that you'd like the UK to sign, sign the TPNW, wouldn't we all? Um, and he, he asked, I understood that Labour's stance was still to proceed with Trident and then said in brackets, sorry if I misunderstood. No, um, Josh, you didn't misunderstand. I mean, the Labour Party did whip uh, its MPs to vote for a renewing Trident. Now, there were, I can't remember how many, 50 or 60 of us in the, in the no lobby at that time. Um, and obviously... I was there with Jeremy Corbyn. I think Lisa Nandy, the current foreign secretary, the shadow foreign secretary, there's a slip. Uh, she also voted against the renewal of Trident. We know in our heart of hearts that this is a colossal waste of money, even those who voted for it. It's a colossal waste of money that could be spent and now should certainly be spent on the parts of the state that support life and support people to do better and give equality of opportunity to everybody. Uh, it is shocking to me that we can even consider this. But I'm afraid, um, Josh, you're right. Uh, at the moment, uh, that is official Labour Party policy. And I have to be clear about that. I will continue to work to change it. Thank you. Um, here's a question for um, Alicia. This is from Richard Outram. Um, Alicia, please can I ask if you believe there is any likelihood that another 10 states will ratify the TPNW to bring it into international law by the end of this 75th anniversary year of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Thank you. Uh, the answer is, is yes. I mean, we're, that's our, our goal and we're really working to get those final ratifications by the end of the year. Um, it's, it's always kind of, uh, you know, a, a bit challenging to know what's going to happen. Uh, especially, you know, as I mentioned, there are so many countries that support the treaty and that want to join it and particularly want to be within that kind of first 50 group of states uh, and to be at the first meeting of states parties and, um, you know, to, to, to be a, one of these first supporters. Um, but there's also often these kind of bureaucratic processes, um, different legislative processes. Uh, there was a question uh, that I answered, um, a written answer about uh, signature and ratification. And the ratification process can be a bit difficult because it uh, 
most of the time requires a, an internal legislative process to approve the treaty and to be legally bound by the articles in the treaty. Um, so it just can take a bit longer for that reason. Um, but, you know, we know there's um, a lot of countries that are in the process and that are working on it. Um, so I certainly hope so, but you can never completely guarantee these things. Thank you. Um, we've got another one for Fabian. This is from uh, Roslyn Cook. And Roslyn um, said, Dear Fabian, hello, hello and thank you for your work. What would you advocate in Parliament the UK position should be when the TPNW enters into force? And would you apply to attend the first meeting of states, parties as an observer? Um, well, to, uh, Rosamond, to answer the last part of your question first, yes, I absolutely would apply uh, to go as an observer, whatever happens. Um, what would I be advocating? Well, uh, you know, I, I think those of you who've seen me speak and heard what I've had to say over the years would know that I would strongly advocate us to become a signatory uh, to the TPNW and to ratify it. Now, I think we've got a long way to go before we do that, because as you know, all the nuclear weapon states uh, boycotted the negotiations at the United Nations on the TPNW. Um, but we have, to, we have to break that deadlock. I, I do believe that what we've just been through these last few months and what is ahead, still ahead of us in terms of our economies and the way it's changed our perception of the kind of society we want to live in and the sort of world we want to continue to live in um, will mean that people are bound to question the, uh, the, the wisdom of carrying on as we were before, of carrying on believing the falsehood that nuclear weapons keep us all safe. And the TPNW is a very good way, I think, for nuclear weapon states to, in a, in a multilateral way, to say we are going to wind them down and disband and get rid of them altogether. I don't think we've got yet, Alicia, a pattern or, sorry, a set of rules for how nuclear weapons uh, armed states uh, can join the, 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 the treaty and, and how quickly they'd have to get rid of all their nuclear weapons. But it's a start and it's something we should grab hold of and, and do the very best we can do uh, to push the British government and the British public and the media towards that. It just doesn't make sense that we carry on as we are. That is not an option. Gosh, I agree. Um, the next question is from uh, Linda Walker, and I think this one's also for you, Fabian. Um, Li Linda says, we, did not we didn't manage to change Labour Party policy on Trident during Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. So do you think we can do it now under a much more pro-establishment leader? Will the move to build back better after COVID give us the opportunity to convince people that Trident cannot meet our real security needs? Well, yes, yes to all that. Um, uh, I, I mean, look, I don't want to repeat what I've just said, but it seems to me that the, the, the landscape's changed. What, I mean, I, I argued very strongly, knowing where Jeremy Corbyn came from uh, politically, on, on, certainly on nuclear weapons, we had a number of discussions about this, but he was understandably wary, and I think his advisors were wary at the time, um, of, of opening up the whole nuclear weapons debate, because it had been in the past, as we remember, so toxic to the Labour Party. But I think the landscape's changed. Now, you're right that the current leadership is more establishment, there's no doubt about that. But what is the new establishment? We are going to have to advocate far more radical policies, I think about the kind of world, the kind of society we want to live in, and what our priorities really are. I mean, money is going to be tight. Or even the advanced economies like uh, the United Kingdom uh, and, and the United States are suffering economically and will continue to suffer economically in recessions and depressions, the like of which we've never seen before. And therefore we have to think to ourselves, where are we going to direct precious resources? Is it going to continue to be spent? on nuclear weapons that are utterly useless. We have to rethink this. And I would strongly urge our leadership to look post-pandemic at the kind of world we want to advocate, which would, would be without nuclear weapons. And I think they may well be willing to listen. I certainly hope so. And I take great encouragement from the fact that, uh, to my absolute surprise and amazement, on after the 4th of April victory of, of Keir Starmer as a party leader, 
a few days after that, he, he rang me up and said, I want you to concentrate not on the Middle East, but to continue your work on peace and disarmament, which is an absolute priority for the next Labour government. Well, I'm going to hold him to that. Nope. Ah, there we go. There we go. There we go. Crikey. Um, <laughs> Jackie. If, if, I, if I was paranoid. <laughs> We've got another question here that maybe maybe both of you could jump in and have, have, a, have a see what you think when I, when I read it out. This is from um, Lydia Merrill, who's a member of CIRA. Uh, the climate emergency and the pandemic-induced global recession requires a green recovery process internationally. How can diplomats and ICANN help policymakers to understand the additional risk from a nuclear winter to other anthro anthropogenic, easy to say, anthropogenic climate damage? And that's from Lydia Merrill. So um, I don't know whether Fabian wants to cover, cover this or Elysia and, or whether you want to take it, take bits of it to each of you. I'm happy to say a few words, but Alicia, you go first. I've said too much already. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, sure. I'm happy to, to jump in a bit on this. Um, you know, something that uh, we really work on in ICANN is, is being an intersectional movement and uh, really understanding and working with the interconnectedness between nuclear disarmament and, of course, the, the climate change movement, uh, racial justice movements. Um, and other movements around the world. Um, and in order to kind of continue to, to spread uh, the information about those links, uh, we really see that we have to partner with those movements whenever we can. Um, and we're still kind of working on that and, and growing on that, um, that initiative. Uh, but one example um, was that back in February, in what seems like a, an era ago, uh, we held a, uh, an activist conference in Paris. And um, I moderated a panel with um, a climate activist who would put her body on the line to block railroads um, to prevent you know, forests from being chopped down, whatever it, it could be, uh, and was really inspired to have the opportunity to hear from her, uh, her strategies as an activist in a different movement. Um, so I think, you know, in order to be able to bring in those who are interested in climate change and, and talk about the, the risks of nuclear weapons to climate change, um, and there are so many links, uh, not only just with nuclear winter, of course, but also how um, nuclear weapons use and testing and production have contaminated uh, land around the world. Um, and how that contamination, especially, you know, in the Marshall Islands, for example, is being threatened uh, by climate change and rising waters. Uh, in order to really be able to point out those links, uh, you know, it's also impar important to, to build authentic relationships with those other movements. So, you know, I think it's something we're still working on and, and learning how to do, but I think that's the, the best way is to, to be able to to also be listening to, to understanding, you know, climate risks and, and working with the climate movement. On, on the, can I come in, Jackie? Yes. Yeah. So on the, uh, on the very day uh, that the lockdown was announced in the UK, my, my eldest daughter gave birth to a second baby, uh, another grandson. Now I want this baby to grow up in a world that is, that can sustain all life not just human life and if the human race is to have a future there's nothing more important for politicians for anybody that's interested in the future of our planet to campaign to stop the destruction of climate and the environment to allow the planet to continue to sustain not just human life but all life and i think nuclear weapons getting rid of nuclear weapons is very much part of that movement they go hand in hand because uh, as we've said time and time again, and I can, you know, I take my hat off, I'm not wearing a hat, but I take my hat off to ICANN because it's one of the most brilliant organizations I've ever had the privilege to work with. Uh, and when I sat and listened to Beatrice Fine and Satsuko Thurlow accept the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo in December 2017, I was, it was one of the greatest moments of my entire life. And I was sent as the UK Labour Party's representative. I was so privileged to be there and I spoke at the rally afterwards, but that's by the by. Um, the fact is that ICANN's got it right. 
that we have to work hand in hand and all I believe all politicians and I'd welcome conservative politicians any politician any political party to look to the future and say how can we stop the planet from being destroyed by human activity so that humanity can carry on but also the rest of the extraordinary diverse life and rich life we have on this planet I want that to, to carry on long after I'm gone and even long after my new grandson's gone it's so important to all of us and we can only do that together by making it a priority for all of us by directing our will our efforts our campaign work by directing ourselves to achieve that end and getting rid of nuclear weapons is absolutely fundamental to that fantastic absolutely um we've got three more questions um so if if, if everybody's happy to indulge that i think um, we should take these last three questions before we wind up if that's okay um Jackie Greenfield, who's a member of the Oldham Peace and Justice Group, has a, um, a question that's very relevant to us here in Oldham, which is where I live too. Um, and this is a question for Fabian. Um, you mentioned the situation in Kashmir in, in relation to the MPP. Is there more on other fronts that you could be doing to highlight the current crisis and its implications for nuclear instability? Well, we are trying hard uh, as a, an opposition team. Uh, to work to bring the parties together. We have a big Kashmiri diaspora here in the United Kingdom and therefore there are many many of our constituents all over the UK but especially in many of our towns and cities. I know in Oldham and Bolton in other towns and cities across the north certainly in Leeds and Bradford um, where votes for political parties depend on where you stand on Kashmir. So we're all quite aware I think of the potential dangers there and the horrors that are currently going on, I have to say, um, especially uh, in Azad Kashmir. But because Pakistan and India both have nuclear weapons, because, you know, the AQ Khan network went completely rampant and sold a lot of that nuclear technology and know-how to other rogue states, we have to try and rein them in. And I think there's no better way of doing that than through the Non-Proliferation Treaty. If we can get India and Pakistan to join the Non-Proliferation Treaty, then we stand a chance of preventing uh, Kashmir, which could turn into a hot war any moment. In fact, some would argue it already has, uh, from erupting into a nuclear conflagration. I mean, that would, just, that would just be such a catastrophe. So I think it's up to all of us to work for this. There are many Conservative MPs I know who represent strong Kashmiri communities um, who also feel the same way, um, although whether they actually see um, getting rid of nuclear weapons as the answer is a, is a different question. Um, but it's something we've got to work for and it's something we must never stop trying to work for. There are other trouble spots too. I mean, I do worry about Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon. We know that Israel already has nuclear weapons. It will never admit it, but it does. And if Iran acquires its nuclear weapons as it has the ambition to do, and I think that's quite clear from what, from what the Iranians are doing in the collapse of the JCPOA, you know, that it, it could also be catastrophic. We've got to work harder, much, much harder to prevent this. Another question from Linda Walker um, for you, Fabian. Do you think current, current discussions about... Actually, no, we've had that. I think she's taken that one. Oh, yes. Sorry, no, 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 she's taken that one down. Um, so Sanjay Joshi, I'm not sure whether, um, whether we really covered this, but I'm going to be cover covering it in my summing up. Um, it's a question to whoever wants to answer this. What do you think is the most pressing gap in activism? I.e., what is the area where grassroots voices aren't loud enough and are most needed? Alicia? <laughs> yeah, I can just say a few words. Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say because I really do admire um, activists in, in all different fields for, you know, it's sometimes people ask uh, when you're working in a field as grim as nuclear weapons and nuclear disarmament, how do you keep going? And it's like, well, look around you at all these incredible people who are making a difference um, and, and taking action just because they, they believe it's right. Um, so, you know, it's hard to say how can they be louder. I think, you know, one thing that uh, we're working on as a movement, um, as I mentioned earlier, is is uh, building more relationships with other activists. 
And I think that is one um, issue kind of across, across the field where we can really kind of get siloed into our own issue um, and not uh, take, you know, it's, it's a, a long and arduous process to really build uh, these deep connections uh, with other organizations and with other movements. And, you know, I think it's something that we're working on and, um, you know, we can continue to improve on. Um, but I think that's one, I'm not sure if that quite answers your question, but, uh, you know, I think it's one thing that we're really um, working to build on as activists is to continue to build those bridges and links with, with other movements. That's a, I think that's a, a very good point. Can I just apologize to Sanjay for calling him Joshi and not Sanjay? My apologies. Um, uh, Sanjay, I think this is a very, very good point. Um, I, parliamentarians especially, but anybody who holds elected office is particularly susceptible these days to pressure from constituents. And I say these days because it's never been more easy to communicate with your elected representative through email, through Facebook, through Twitter, uh, through personal visits once they're allowed again uh, at, at surgeries. Um, and I think that we need to do more to uh, really push our elected representatives into taking the kind of views that we're campaigning for all the time. We mustn't forget that they're there to serve us, including me, including all my colleagues. And we are quite susceptible to that pressure. The more constituents that turn up at surgeries, that tweet us, that Facebook us, that uh, send us emails, not, I don't mean those you know, emails where you click, you know, sort of armchair warrior type stuff. I mean, people who've thought about what they want to say to their MP and have put it in writing in their own words. That is a very powerful tool. And we need to do a lot more of that in order to, to persuade our parliamentarians, our other representatives in local government, uh, unfortunately no longer in the European Union, um, to do the things that we think will guarantee a future, a safe future for our world uh, and for humanity. Uh, we have to do that. And I think that includes obviously the abolition of nuclear weapons combined with a real saving measures that will save uh, the future of our planet. We've got to put them uh, hand in glove and work much, much harder towards them. Thank you. One final question, um, which I did start to ask, but um, the screen was suddenly whizzing questions away, so my eyes went a bit peculiar. The final one from Linda Walker. Um, uh, can I ask Fabian, do you think that the current discussions about imperialism and soul searching about Britain's negative and oppressive role in the past might be used to explore Britain's possession of nuclear weapons and how that is linked to our clinging on to being a major power? And this is the last question. Thank you, everybody. Gosh, Linda, um, that's, that's a really good question. Um, yes, I mean, I think, I think we could tie in... Um, I mean, I mean, the thing that really worries me at the moment is we've left the European Union. We've been through this coronavirus, which has taken so many lives before their time, uh, but has caused massive economic damage for very good reason. And we're still talking about being a global power. We're not a global power. Um, the Americans have made that absolutely clear that we're not a global power unless we do what they say. But we are still, we do still have a place on the United Nations uh, Security Council, a permanent place. But that, of course, is a relic of the Second World War. And I don't think it's sustainable myself. I'm not arguing that we should give up that place. But, you know, why has India not got a place on the UN Security Council? Why are there many other countries that should have, that are emerging economies uh, and, and emerging powers? And I think you can tie that to our imperial past. And you can tie that to the horrible, vile abuse of a certain part of humanity throughout the centuries, uh, which is now being played out after the death of George Floyd in America and with Black Lives Matter. These are all linked. So yes, I think that's a very good point. Let us further link um, the fight against our past imperialism, our past, some of the worst parts of our previous history, and tie that into nuclear weapons and the idea that we're no longer a global power. Our nuclear weapons wouldn't make a slightest bit of difference except to, uh, except to force further destruction of our planet and of humanity and of life. Let's actually take a lead for a change. And one of the things I've advocated, I'll finish on this, Jackie, if I may. One of the things I've been advocating for the last four years is that we have 
a small but a very, very good military uh, force, you know, our military personnel. I'm not a great militarist myself, but the, I think it was the Icelandic ambassador who said to me once, you know, the Americans train their soldiers to kill people. And I don't know if anybody saw that program on Iraq last night. That was never more true than in Iraq. But the British train their soldiers to save lives. And if you go around the world, there is huge respect for the incorruptibility of British armed forces and the brilliant way that they behave compared with so many others. Well, let's use our part imperialist past to pay back, to give back to the world something that we can do. And that is help prevent conflict, help to reconstruct nations post-conflict, help in natural or man-made disasters, like for example, the appalling persecution of the Rohingya people uh, in Myanmar, uh, being, being forced to flee to Bangladesh and being treated as non-people, non as well as of course the natural disasters that occur. Let's use our military forces not to fight wars and further conflicts, but to save life. That would be the best way we could pay back for our imperial past and some of the bad things we've done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for um, such fantastic questions. And thank you to our um, speakers um, who've just been, I think, inspirational and answering questions so fantastically. Um, that's the end of, of, of uh, the webinar part. I just want to finish off um, by saying the end of the nuclear age is a commitment that every government around the world should be signing up to, as we've heard. Of course, it makes sense morally, but it also makes sense from an economic point of view if they want to go there. And we've been going there quite a lot over these last four or five months. So tonight's speakers have given us a lot to be thinking about, and that's fantastic. But we'd like you to leave this webinar with a commitment, a commitment to do at least one productive thing for nuclear disarmament and peace. So Alicia has told us about um, the T TPNW and how the UK government, and we've heard obviously from Fabian as well, how the UK government refused to sign the treaty and actively disrupted talks um, at the UN in, in 2017. So no commitment there. So it's up to us to put pressure on the UK government, grassroots activists. We've heard about grassroots activists and what they can do. Um, so we can do this by working in our own communities and there's a number of ways to do it. I won't run through all of them here. Um, we can send you out some information um, to all of the um, attendees after, after the um, webinar. Um, and there's going to be some links coming up on, on chat, but you can encourage your city or town to sign up to the um, nuclear ban community campaign. Manchester was the first city in the UK to sign up and others have followed quickly behind, including quite recently for us, the people, the, the people here that are from the Oldham area, Shaw and Crompton Parish Council um, have signed up to it as well. So um, you can either go onto the ICANN Cities Appeal um, link on their website or to CND UK at the Nuclear Ban Communities to see if your city or town has signed up and all the information that you will need um to to do that and to get on with that obviously your local cnd group might already be talking to your local council so it's definitely worth contacting them to see if you can help to see if if they can help you if you want to contact your your local um uh, town council or city council um think about your ward councillors it's always worth going speaking to them so you can get one of them on your one of them on your side they're always a really useful first contact if you want to start talking to your local council Ask them if they would put forward um, a draft motion to the, to the council and CND has got a draft motion on the nuclear ban communities section. Does your council hold open meetings where community members can go and ask questions? It's usual to go and submit a, um, it's usual to submit a question first. Um, so check out your council's website for details of the process. That's a really um, useful thing to do. Always useful as well, also useful to ask questions about possible council investment in, in nuclear weapons. This could be part of their pension scheme. Oh, that's, that's a useful question to ask. Um, if they're not sure or unclear, follow it up with your friendly councillor, if you've got that nice word councillor, um, and see if they'll ask the question. Is your council a member of the Nuclear Free Local Authorities? Sean will be pleased um, about this. So um, always welcome new members of the NFLA and ask if your council is a member of Mayors for Peace. Um, 
We'll put, we'll give you anybody that's, that's interested. We'll give you Sean Morris's contact details. You can get in touch with him. He's really friendly, really happy to help out and to help you to um, approach your um, city and, and town councils. Uh, put parliamentary pressure on. Um, put pressure on in the House of Commons uh, via your MP. Get in touch with them and talk to them about the issue. Um, use the ICAM parliamentary pledge materials. They're, they're a really good resource. Get involved with Build Back Better. Uh, Build Back Better is a coalition of groups and organisations, including CND. Uh, obviously, from CND's point of view, we're, we're uh, campaigning for a, a more socially productive use of public money i.e. no spending on Trident. So um, to have a look for CND's involvement with Build Back Better, go on to CND's website and just tap in Build Back Better. And join Build Back Better. There are, there are groups all over, groups all over the United Kingdom. All of these links will be sent out to you after the web webinar, so please do get involved. And if you do nothing else, we hope you will do some of those things, please join CND. If you only do one thing, join CND. It's really straightforward, but it's absolutely vital. And do it now before you log off from your device and before you go and put the kettle on. And the other thing, the last one, last final thing before we sign off is the 75th anniversary of the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as we know is coming up in August. So we really do hope um, that you will join um, our webinar on the 9th of August on Nagasaki Day at one o'clock where we'll have Joseph Gerson from the United States and Rieko Asato from um, the Japan Council Against A&H Bombs will be speaking. Um, it promises to be a very, very interesting uh, webinar. Um, we hope that you will get involved with that. And thank you again. Thank you very, very much for every, to everybody that attended to listen to our wonderful speakers and Alethea and Fabian and to the, the backroom guys that have made this all happen, to Matt and, um, and to Andrew, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you.